Okay. Module number six. This week it's all about cryptography. Historical methods of cryptography predate mathematics, but rather on techniques for scrambling text. A cipher is a method used to scramble or obfuscate characters to hide their value. Ciphering is the process of using a cipher to do the scrambling. The two primary non-mathematical cryptography are substitution and transposition. Uh, I will do my best to talk about the various ciphers. For Security Plus, you don't have to know all the math behind it to be able to solve the math behind it. So we'll talk more high level about the, the different cryptographic algorithms and whatnot. Um, you will be playing with cryptography this week. But this is coming from somebody who absolutely dislikes math. And I'm really glad that the Security Plus exam doesn't require you to do all kinds of math. Besides, we have computers to do that for us. So, a substitution cipher changes one character or symbol for another. They can be relatively easy for encrypting information with one of the oldest and one of the most known is the Caesar cipher. It involves shifting all letters a certain number of spaces in the alphabet. Decrypting a message that was encrypted with the Caesar cipher follows the reverse process. Another way that you'll see substitution is ROT, R-O-T, which really is just short for rotate. Uh, one of the more common is ROT13, so rotating 13 spaces, but that doesn't always have to be. You can rot rotate 1 through 25. So something like, I will pass the exam, looks like that which at first may seem completely random, but then you start using some analysis to go, hey, a single letter, four letters, four letters, three, four, and you can start guessing what could possibly fit in here, kind of like playing hangman, or using uh, tools online to help you decipher what this could possibly be. One of the problems with substitution ciphers is that they did not change the underlying letter and word frequency of the text. One cipher that has multiple substitution alphabets for the same message are the polyalphabetic, with one of the most more famous is one by a French guy that I always mispronounce, Vignier. I've heard some people say vin Vinaigrette, even though that's not even close to how you spell out the name but anyway <laughs> you got to use a keyword to look up the cipher text in a table the user would take the first letter in the text match that with the letter of the keyword in order to find the cipher text repeating until the message is encrypted each letter in the keyword generating a different substitution alphabet so for example if you wanted to use this cipher to encrypt a phrase called secret message, and you wanted to use the keyword apple, you would begin by lining up the characters as so. Then you would create the cipher text by looking up each pair of plain text and key characters on the table. So looking at uh, the column for S, right here, and then look at the row A to find the ciphertext value is also S. You would repeat that for the next letter, E. So here's the E column, and we're looking at P, so we gotta go down until we find a T. That's where the E and P collide. And then we would do the same for the letter C. Here's the letter C, we go all the way down until we find the letter P. It's an R. 
and so on and so forth. In the end, this is what we would get. Multiple substitution ciphers in one. To decrypt, you would need to do the reverse, but you would need to know what the key was in order to figure out the proper lineup between the rows and the columns. Transposition ciphers involve transposing or scrambling the letters in a certain manner. Typically, a message is broken into blocks of equal size and then scrambled. Columnar transposition is a classic example. You choose the number of rows in advance, which will be your encryption key. You then write your message by placing susceptive characters in the next row until you get to the bottom of a, of a column, like this. Here's meet me in the store. The ciphertext is then read across the rows instead of down the columns. Again, to decrypt, uh, you should know uh, how many rows to be able to recreate the matrix and work your way back. And we can't talk about encryption without talking about this old machine, the German Enigma. The operator would configure the machine to use the code of the day by setting the rota rotary dials, rotary dials at the top of the machine and wires on the front of the machine. The inner workings of the machine implemented a polyalphabetic substitution, changing the substitution for each character of the message. Steganography, or Stego for short, is the art of using cryptographic techniques to embed secret messages within another file. Stego algorithms work by making alterations to the least significant bits of the many bits that make up an image file, typically. These changes are so minor that there's no appreciable effect on the viewed image. So this picture of a bunch of flags could easily have a text file within it and you would never know by looking at it. This allows for communicating parties to hide messages in plain sight. They can be hidden within an image, a video, or an audio file because often they're large enough that messages can be easily missed. Of course, technology like this is used for illegal purposes such as espionage and child pornography. A legitimate usage for steganography is digital watermarks in order to protect intellectual property. And stego can be done with freely available and with commercial tools. There are four main goals of cryptography, the four main reasons why it exists. It has the CIA triangle and one more. So with confidentiality, it's pretty much the same. Data remains private in all situations, data at rest, data in transit, and data in use. We can either do that with the symmetric or asymmetric crypto systems that we'll talk about in just a bit. Cryptography's goals is integrity, ensuring that data is not altered without the authorization. This can be done with message digests uh, to verify the digital signature is valid. It also has authentication, verifying the claimed identity of system users is a major function of crypto systems with like challenge response authentication. 
and the new one to the family, non-repudiation. It provides assurance to the recipient that the message was originated by the sender and not someone masquerading as the sender. On the flip side, it also prevents the sender from claiming they never sent the message in the first place. That's a nice little tricky tricky there. So yes, a criminal can use cryptography to hide what information they're sending. They also can't deny that it was them who sent it. All cryptographic algorithms rely on keys in order to maintain their security, just like our houses, just like our cars, just like our safes. Usually a key is very large binary number. Every algorithm has a specific key space, the range of values that are valid for use as a key. Just like your house key only, or your house locks only accept a, ter a certain type or brand of key. Like if you have master locks all over your house, well, it's going to accept master locks. A key space is defined by the key length, the number of binary bits in the key. The key space is in the range between the key that has all zeros and ones from zero to uh, two to the n power, where n is the bit size of the key. All of the security you gain from cryptography rests on your ability to keep the keys that are being used private from the world. So the art of creating and implementing secret codes and ciphers is called cryptography. The practice is paralleled by cryptanalysis, the study of methods to defeat codes and ciphers, like what was used against the Enigma machine. Together, Cryptography and cryptanalysis are normally referred under the umbrella of cryptography or cryptology. My bad. So as mentioned, uh, ciphers are algorithms used to perform encryption and decryption operations. Cipher suites are the sets of ciphers and key lengths supported by a system. And there are two major cipher categories. We have the block. which applies encryption to an entire message chunk. The transposition ciphers are examples of this. Uh, most modern encryption algorithms implement some type of block cipher. The other type is the stream. Applies an encryption algorithm to one character or bit of message at a time. For example, like the Caesar cipher is a stream cipher. In the early days of cryptography, one of the predominant principles was security through obscurity. The way things will be secure is if people don't know about them. Modern crypto systems do not rely on this principle. Most are widely available for public review as this improves their security. Widespread analysis of algorithms allow practitioners to discover and correct potential security vulnerabilities and ensure that algorithms that are being used are secure as possible. Because again, it's not about is the math behind it the, the essential part. The essential part is the key. If the key is protected and the math is verified to work over and over again, that's a good sign. Most crypto systems rely on the secrecy of one or more keys used to personalize the algorithm. The, the length of the key is an important factor in determining the strength of the crypto system and the likelihood that the encryption won't be compromised through crypto analytic techniques. So, the first of two main algorithms is the symmetric. They relied on a shared secret. 
that is distributed to all members who participate. The same key is used by all parties to encrypt and decrypt messages. When large sized keys are used, symmetric encryption can be difficult to break. Symmetric is also a thousand to ten thousand times faster than asymmetric, but it also has its weaknesses. For example, key distribution. Everybody has to have the same exact key. There is no non-repudiation. There's no way to prove where a message originated since any party can encrypt it or decrypt it with the same key. Symmetric is not scalable. Securing communications between individuals is harder to achieve if each possible combination of users has a private key. And you would have to regenerate keys often because each time a participant leaves a group, all the keys known have to be discarded and recreated. The other algorithm is the asymmetric key family, also known as public key cryptography. Each user has two different keys. There is a public key that is shared with everyone and a private key kept secret and known only to the owner of the key pair. This can also be used to provide digital signatures since a user can encrypt a message using their private key and anyone can verify by using the public. So think of the two more like symmetric is like your house key. If you have multiple people living in your house, everybody's going to have a copy of the same key. That would be symmetric key algorithm. Compared to asymmetric, which could be like your mailbox. The mailman may or may not have to use a key in order to put mail into your mailbox, but only you have the key that will unlock the mailbox and see the contents of it. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay. Um, so, some strengths of asymmetric. Uh, new users require generation of one key pair. Users can be removed easily. Key regeneration occurs when a private key is compromised. It provides integrity, authentication, and non-repudiation. Key distribution is simple because everybody makes their own keys and there's no pre-existing communication link necessary. Whereas symmetric, you have to have some form of communication ahead of time to send the key. Asymmetric, not so much. But the weakness of this, the major one, is it's slow. So here's the two. Symmetric and asymmetric. And check out how at scale this can get pretty crazy. So if you're just using symmetric keys and you have 10,000 people you need 49 million different keys compared to asymmetric you just need 20,000. Isn't that nuts?
the last of these um, algorithms is one that's not talked about too often, but it's definitely useful, is hashing. Message digests are summaries of a message's content produced by a hashing algorithm. It is ideally extremely difficult to derive a message from an ideal hash function, and very unlikely that two messages will produce the same hash value. Although that's not to say it's impossible because it happens, it does happen. That's why we have MD5 because MD4 made collisions and MD3 made collisions, which are those, uh, it, which is that when two messages produce the same hash value, even though the two messages are different from each other. So whenever collisions happen, then people stop using that hash function because it no longer it can be trusted. Okay, now we're going to get into the, uh, the more mathy side of things. But like I said, it's more high level. You don't need to get out no uh, pen and paper. Because even I would freak out. I would just bust out my calculator and go, okay, if we're going to do math, let me go get my, uh, my Apple calculator and do this. Because, yeah, no. The oldest of the symmetric cryptographies is the Data Encryption Standard, or DES. It is It came into existence in 77. Of course, it's deemed insecure. It uses a key of 56 bytes long and operates on 64 bits of plain text at a time. DES uses an XOR process that, re that is repeated 16 times or 16 rounds and has a couple of modes of operation. The electronic codebook mode, which is the least secure. The cipher block chaining mode, which is more secure and uses a initialization vector, which is a randomly selected value to start the encryption process. It has a cipher feedback mode and a counter mode. Well, this uh, did not live long. People created the triple des. It is its successor. There are four different types of triple des because the first one wasn't safe enough. And it's really just like everything else. It's a big old cat and mouse game. Now, if somebody finds a new way to encrypt data and then someone works to break it. And on and on and on it goes. So there's four different kinds of triple deaths. And that all got replaced by the advanced encryption standard introduced in October of 2000. It has three main keys, the 128-bit key requiring 10 rounds of encryption, the 192-bit key with 12 rounds, and 256 with 14 rounds. As I said, your key is everything. So you could create and distribute keys offline Either things like a uh, good old sneaker net, walking the key literally to another person, like on a USB stick or something, not on the network, or other non-technical form, like over the mail, like snail mail, or the phone, etc. You could team it up with public key encryption, where the public key cryptography establishes the secure communication since you need less keys for that and then transfer a symmetric key through that tunnel. Uh, there's also the Diffie-Hellman which is key exchange algorithm built to exchange secret keys. 
As with any key management, never store an encryption key on the same system where the encrypted data resides. That's the equivalent of don't put your house key on the mat at your front door. Everybody knows to check there. For sensitive keys, dealing with things that are secret, top secret level, consider split knowledge, which is providing two different individuals with half the key. They have to collaborate to recreate the actual key. In the world of asymmetric cryptography. Oh, yeah. Make sure that you get rid of the keys when you don't need them. In the world of asymmetric cryptography, one of the most famous is RSA. RSA stands for the, the three guys who made it, Rivest, Shamir, and Edelman. It depends on computational difficulty inherent in factoring large prime numbers. This is the ugly math that you got to go through it. I am not going to make you suffer through this madness. There are tons of online tools that will do it for you. This is not math class. There's the elliptic curve. Using two points with the same curve group together into an algorithm. I mentioned hashing, taking a message and generating a unique output. Uh, there are five basic requirements for a hash function. It has to be able to accept an input of any length and produce a fixed length output regardless how big the input is. It has to be relatively easy to compute. It must be one way and be collision free which again, not everything is collision free. So you want to use the bigger ones like SHA-256 and up. Uh, too far, too far, too far. There we go. In this realm, there's two big ones that you should be aware of is the secure hash algorithm and MD5. Uh, the secure hash algorithm are government standards by NIST. The official publication is FIPS 180. SHA-1 produces 160-bit message digests, making 512-bit blocks. If a block is not a multiple of 512, the message will be padded. SHA-1 is weak. That's why SHA-2 came out. Uh, SHA-2, though it's, this, it's considered secure, it does have theoretically the same weaknesses as SHA-1, so SHA-3 was made as the replacement. Within the realm of SHA-2, there are four variants, and those are the four variants you, or three of the four you see here. SHA-256, SHA-224, SHA-512, and 384. MD5 was made in 91 by Ron Rivest, the same guy from RSA. It, pro it processes 512-bit blocks for, of a message using four distinct rounds to produce 128-bit digests. It is subject to collisions. Now the next slide into digital signatures. They enforce non-repudiation, the you can't say you didn't send it, and assure the recipient that the message was not altered while in transit between the sender and recipient, protecting against any mal malicious or unintentional modification. Digital signatures rely on a combination of public key cryptography and hashing functions together. Hashed Message Authentication Code, or HMAC, 
implements a partial digital signature. It guarantees the integrity of a message, but not non-repudiation. HMAC relies on shared secrets. It's like a halfway point between unencrypted use of a message digest algorithm and a computationally expensive digital signature based on public key cryptography. There's also the digital signature standard, FIPS 186-4 from NIST. All federally approved digital signatures must have SHA-3. And it also specifies some approved alg encryption algorithms. These are the little details that you need to be aware of in the Security Plus exam. The which algorithm has what bit message size, what bit block. What's the difference between symmetric, asymmetric, and hashing? Is RSA asymmetric or an asymmetric or a hashing? Is MD5 clear of collisions? All these little things are what shows up on the test, which is why I'm taking my time to read through them all because they show up. This next section is on public key infrastructure. And the big place that we use these things are in certificates. Digital certificates, which you see all the time in browsers, for example, provide assurance that the communicators are who they say they are. Digital certificates are endorsed copies of an individual's public key. When users verify that a certificate was signed by a trusted certificate authority, or the acronym CA, they know that the public key is legitimate. There is a standard for these, and that's the X.509. All certificates that are X509 have a number of attributes, the version number, the serial number, signature algorithm, issuer name, validity period, subject common name, subject public key. The current version is version number three. Now these CAs, they are neutral organizations that offer notarization services for digital certificates. In order to obtain a cert from a CA, you have to prove your identity. Nothing prevents any organization from becoming a certificate authority. The certs issued from any CA are only as good as the trust placed in the CA that issued them. Therefore, if you don't recognize and trust the name of a CA that issued the cert, you shouldn't place trust on that cert. Public key infrastructure relies on a hierarchy of trust relationships. There's also the registration authority, or RA, who assist CAs with the burden of verifying users' identity prior to issuing certs. CAs must carefully protect their own private keys to preserve their trust relationship. This is usually achieved with an offline CA to protect the root certificate. The offline CA uses that root certificate to create subordinate intermediate CAs that serve as online CAs that issue new certs on a routine basis. This whole process is, based, is what's called certificate chaining. So if you would like to make a website and use a certificate in order to implement things like HTTPS, you could normally go to like Let's Encrypt, who can issue you a certificate for free. You'll have to identify yourself, give them some information, and then you can get a cert. That certificate 
that verifies your site is who it says it is, is chained to a number of Let's Encrypt servers that will all verify your uh, the legitimacy of the cert. As with anything, certificates have to go through a process. They have they have a life cycle. You should not make a a certificate and then just use it till the end of time. You want to bring it through a life cycle and change it. Let's Encrypt makes this happen every 90 days. This is a good thing. Uh, most of the certificate authorities allow a cert to live for no more than two years, which again is a good thing. You don't want the same certificate to be used over and over again, be broken or compromised, and then used for malicious purposes. You want it to have an expiration date because you want to reissue a new one so that anybody who's trying to be malicious and break the, the certificate won't be able to in time. There are a couple of formats that you should be aware of that again show up on the test. You have the distinguished encoding rules, the privacy enhanced mail, personal information exchange, and P7B. For asymmetric key management, again, use your encryption system wisely. Use algorithms that are public domain and thoroughly vetted by industry experts. It is highly, highly recommended to not use any unknown or newly created uh, algorithms. It's much, much better, much safer to use a algorithm that has been vetted by the public. Select your appropriate key. Use a key link that balances your security requirements with your performance. Just because you can use a really large key doesn't mean you should use a really large key if you have a lot of systems that are older who are going to need to take more time to do the math and be able to establish communication. Keep your keys, your especially your private key, secret. Don't let others don't don't let it get compromised. Retire keys. Use a key rotation policy. You don't want to continue to use the same key over and over and over again. Back it up. And if you can, use hardware security modules to store and manage your keys. Of course, there are tons of attacks against cryptography. Here is a list of a few that show up on the test. You have the brute force, trying every possible key. It's guaranteed to work, but it will take so long it's simply not usable due to the amount of time it'll take. There's the frequency analysis, looking at blocks of an encrypted message to determine any common patterns. Over time, an analyst will deduce the method used to encrypt the data. So if you're using substitution cipher or Caesar cipher, for example, uh, and you know that the message was uh, in English, then you know if you look at a message and you see a lot of W's, you could generally assume that those are actually E's because E is the most common letter in the English alphabet. And then you work your way down, the most common RSTLN. That'll help you build out the possible message and then you just keep going from there. That's why Wheel of Fortune does that. 
there's the known plain text. Attackers have pairs of known plain text and their corresponding ciphertext, giving them a place to start to attempt to derive the key. For example, during World War II, the British realized that all German messages ended with Heil Hitler and used that to crack the key. Chosen plain text. Attacker obtains ciphertext corresponding to a set of plain texts of their choosing, allowing them to derive the key. There's the related key attack, similar to the plain text, but the attacker can obtain ciphertext encrypted under two different keys. It's a useful attack if you can obtain the plain text and their matching ciphertext. There is the birthday, pay, uh, birthday attack. It's normally a, an attack on hashes based on the principle of in a room of people, how many will have the same birthday. The birthday paradox tells us that we have 51% chance of a collision, which is much, much smaller than brute forcing. There is the downgrade used against things like TLS in an attempt to get the user or the system to inadvertently shift to a less secure cryptographic mode against hashes. The biggest threat is the rainbow tables. They have they, it's a pre-computed list of hashes. Thus, all you really need to do is search the table to find the answer. The common approach to fight back against rainbow tables is salting, adding randomly generated values to each password prior to hashing. Windows does not do this. Windows does not salt their passwords. Everything in the Unix family, including Linux, does. Exploiting weak keys. Good cryptographic algorithms must be implemented against any weak manners, like using a weak key generation. And of course, the biggest threat, in my opinion, is human error, like using weak or deprecated algorithms, misconfiguration, or leaving systems at their default configuration. Uh, lastly, some emerging issues in cryptography. Tor and the dark web. Tor, or the onion router, provides a mechanism for anonymously routing traffic across the internet using encryption and a set of relay nodes. It relies on perfect forward secrecy, layers of encryption, uh, that prevent nodes in the relay chain from reading anything other than specific information that they need to accept and forward traffic. There's the blockchain, a distributed and immutable public ledger, storing records in a way that distributes those records among many different systems located around the world to prevent anyone from uh, tampering with the records. The major application of this, of course, is cryptocurrency. Uh, there is lightweight cryptography. Some devices operate at extremely low power and put a premium on conserving energy, like satellites, smart cards, uh, high resiliency stuff. They can't really do uh, the things like RSA, they don't have the power to do it. There's homomorphic encryption. Encrypts data in a way that, pre that preserves the ability to perform computation on the data while protecting the privacy of individuals. In use, when you encrypt data and perform computation on it, the result when the decrypted matches would get you if you had performed the computation on the plain text in the first place. So it's not really that useful. And the upcoming threat that we've been hearing for a while is quantum, where it's, it's theoretical right now. I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. Uh, I would just keep listening 
as it, in theory, should be able to defeat the current cryptographic systems. But it's not, it's not accessible enough that it's going to be a real threat right now. Just know that it exists. It's in the horizon. Soon it'll arrive, but not quite yet. Any questions on all this fun stuff? Okay, seeing no questions. The work this week is not to go to try hack me this time. And no sad face. You're actually going to go to a different site this week. Crypto hack. Your goal is to get to a minimal of level six and submit a screenshot that you arrived to level six. I will grant you bonus points if you join me Saturday, October 16. The person who creates CryptoHack will be joining me for a chat. You are more than welcome to join. What you would submit is a simple report of what you learned from the presentation. So once again, jump onto CryptoHack. You'll have to register, of course. You gotta work your way up to level six minimum. The further you go, the better. And as always, you submit a screenshot that you made it to at least level six. Um, and then this is Saturday, October 16 at 9 a.m. The link to the Zoom is this exact one. The same Zoom that I'm streaming from now is the same one that I'll be using on Saturday, October 16. Any questions? <laughs> 